Um, I'm DTL. Thanks for coming and participating in the session. I realise that it sounds like kind of an odd name for a talk. Um, I'm sure as we get into it, you'll um, hopefully get a handle on, on what I'm talking about. Um, if you want to tweet me any questions, if you want to follow up anything afterwards, my Twitter handle is The Web Princess. So is my website is The Web Princess. Pretty much anywhere you look for The Web Princess, you'll find Disney princesses and me. Um, I'm not really a princess. <laughs> So this is what we're going to talk about in the, over the next 20 minutes, adding value. And we'll talk, as the talk progresses, you'll get a little bit of an understanding of where this idea of adding value came from. Um, I'm a project manager. I work with large scale clients building big software projects um, and manage teams that, that uh, cover a great geographical distance. Um, so adding value is something that's become very, very important in what we're doing. Slide number one. See, we'll get through these first slides really easily. Ah, oh, no, we won't. I need the presentation to actually show my notes. Um, so. Alrighty, okay, so let's go back up. Okay, so take a moment um, before we start to think about the following. What are the things in your life that you value the most? I'm guessing that for most of us, those things aren't necessarily the things that we paid a lot of cash for. They will be the pictures on the fridge that our kid drew the things that we've made or built with our own hands, the things that we've worked for, the family relationships, the friendships in our life. These are the things that are most important, right? So let me put a different spin on that. And let me ask you this question. When have you felt that you and what you offer were valued by someone or furthermore by a client or by a company? How did that feel? One of the things that helped prompt this talk is finding myself in a situation where I, there was an obvious competition between me and the company that I re represent and another company offering pretty much exactly the same thing. And I had to start to quantify exactly what it was about us and me that made a distinction for the client so that they would be prepared to pay our prices for the work that we did as opposed perhaps to somebody else who might charge them less. And this was actually a really difficult thing to do and I think we'll probably all find that as we sit here in this room, a group of us, no doubt many of whom are competing in a very similar marketplace, it's actually quite difficult to decide or, or to articulate what it is about you that sets you apart from the person next to you who's doing exactly the same thing. So in the next 20 minutes, we're gonna try and unpack how we convey our value to our clients but also what we can do to make our value more demonstrable to clients. The most obvious demonstration of value in a business relationship is when you can demonstrate to a client or uh, to a manager, um, I will save you money. And you can do that fairly easily by pricing yourself at lower than your competitors. Now, in my opinion, that's the lowest common denominator. Anyone can adjust their prices, and as each successive person adjusts their prices down, it's a race to the bottom. And at the end of the day, if your client is only interested in saving money, you'll be completely expendable as soon as someone else comes along who will price themselves at lower than you. So we're going to go right past this as an option. Um, there are better ways to demonstrate our value. So... I asked some of my peers what they do to demonstrate their value to the clients. 
and I'm having problems with presenter here. For some, it's about proving their expertise. For others, it's about the relationship that they build and maintain with their client. But for all of them, the biggest demonstration of value is what they uniquely bring to their particular project. So this is my revelation about value. Um, there are no doubt other value statements that you can make um, that you could go and research if you wanted to look more and more about what you can actually do to demonstrate your value to somebody. Um, but we've only got 20 minutes. Uh, so we're going to dwell on this one. Adding value isn't about telling people about your services. It's about listening to them and offering what they need. And I'm just going to preface the, this first section that we're going to talk about is adding value in client relations. Uh, before you can even go adding value in this, you actually have to believe in your own value. You can make all of these statements about the value that you have, but unless you actually believe in yourself that this is the value that you offer, this is um, problematic to try and deliver. Um, I could probably do another whole talk on that, so we'll think about that at another point. But um, hopefully by the time you get to the end of this, you'll actually have some tools to help give you confidence to actually deliver some of this. You do have things, you uniquely have things that set you apart from your competitors and what you offer will add value to your client. And so for the next, for this first section of the talk, we're going to talk about that, adding that value in client relations. The first thing you can do is actually listen to them. How many times have you, oh, just as a show of hands, how many of you are actually freelancers building client sites, doing client work? How many of you, uh, thank you, uh, so how many times have you taken a client meeting and spent the whole conversation thinking about or thinking ahead to how you're going to make their website, what plugins you're going to use, how you'll set up the custom content and generally losing yourself in what you'll be doing rather than actually hearing what the client needs. So it's time to stop taking meetings like that and actually instead listen to what your client or your potential client is telling you about what they need. Listen for things as they're talking that they may not have considered. Remember, you're the expert in this situation. You understand what you're offering. And the client is trying to articulate to you what it is that they need. And they may have an idea of the results they want to get. They may not necessarily know the steps to get those results. But have a listen and understand really clearly before you even start to try and decide what you're going to build. Have a listen to understand what it is that the client's trying to articulate to you and what it is they actually want to get out of this. So the first demonstration of value you can give them is an understanding that it's all about them and that what you're trying to do is to build and serve them and their clients. It's not all about you. And I heard anybody's feelings then. <laughs> A little bit careful. So it's also possible you're going to hate me by the time this is over because the recurring thread throughout this whole conversation is actually about putting other people's needs ahead of your own. And pretty much everything in you at some point is going to say, but what about me? Um, we'll come to that, I promise. Uh, for now, trust me that if you make your client's success as your priority and help your clients serve their customers, it will reap benefits for you in the long term. And I'm actually living proof of that and we'll talk a little bit about that at the end. I also want to say, because I know that some of my clients are in the room, <laughs> uh, there's a difference between servicing your clients and serving them. I want to be really clear that serving a client doesn't actually always mean doing exactly what they say. I'm like, I'm going to lose my job soon. <laughs> but in actual fact, um, because I'm not trying to toy, turn you into a doormat, I know it's really, really easy when you've got clients, they're paying you money, they're, they're, they're doing all of... You know, they're putting a lot of pressure on you, but at the end of the day, you have to be able to have some strong conversations. You have to be confident enough that what you're doing is the right thing and the right thing for them and be able to articulate that and stand up and be able to put boundaries in when somebody says, we need to do this. It's, it's okay to have the conversation that says, so have you thought about and be able to turn some of those conversations around. I'm not saying that the client is wrong. I'm not saying also that the client is always right. But you do have to be able to be internally strong enough to actually do not just what they want, but what's best. Of course, to be able to do that, you have to be able to have an understanding of what is best. So you need to be well-researched 
and strong in your understanding of what it is that the client needs and confident enough in your relationship with them to be able to articulate some of those things. Um, one of the challenges around that is that you have to have the client's trust before you can get into those situations and, um, and some of those hard conversations and building up trust is a, in a lot of cases um, comes down to really clear and honest communication. So all of these things, things like, um, I can't even remember what the previous slide was, serving, <laughs> it happens out of, out of a place of relationship. How do you build a relationship with your client? You talk and you listen. So I'm fairly new at project management actually. I've been doing it permanently, I guess, for at least the last 12 months, but um, as a contractor for 18 months before that. One of the enduring characteristics of a lot of the projects I've actually happened to end up on have been that they've all been difficult. I'm not quite sure what it is about me that attracts the difficult projects. Um, we've had crazy tight deadlines. We've had huge software spaghetti messes that we've had to come in and fix. Uh, we've had demanding and difficult clients and we've had to build their trust that because their trust had been eroded by an unre unreliable dev in a previous experience and I'm pretty sure a lot of us will have come across situations like that where we're coming in to fix up a mess and we have to build up this trust with our new client. At the end of the day <coughs> I found that with all of them one of the one consistent way it's been possible for our team to get back into that place of trust is to be open and honest in our, in our communication with them. Uh, it means being responsive when somebody asks for something. It may be a question of, hey Dee, can you do this for us? I can get back to them fairly quickly and say, yes I can, but I can do that on Tuesday. It's better than waiting until Tuesday to say, yes I'll do it for you now. If the client has an understanding that you've heard them and that you have their issue in control, you have a, that, and then you deliver on Tuesday, you have a much better platform of trust going so that the next time they say to you, hey Dee, can you do a thing? If for whatever reason I haven't been able to get back to them in the usual speedy time, I've got a lot of trust in the bank already. So I can, I was gonna say get away with it, it's probably not quite the right word when this client's in the room, but, but you can, can manage those expectations. And one of the big things that we've been able to, that I'm happy, well one of the things that I consider a huge part of my job is expectation management and making sure that not only my team who are working for me, but the people that I'm working for understand where we're at. And one of the things that I'm quite proud of is that we take that very seriously, um, that kind of communication, because that communication is what our tool is to build that trust. So it doesn't actually mean being on call 24 seven, but it does mean being responsive and being proactive so in a lot of cases too, um, one of the things that we'll do is be fairly forward facing around keeping the client in the loop of what's happening, even if it's information they haven't asked for. Um, if we're being really active in our communication with them, um, it helps us in the long run. So it's really a very high level overview around client relations. What about adding value in the actual physical management and ongoing day-to-day um, -day aspects of the project? So you've landed the gig. What are some of the ways that you can add value or demonstrate your extra value in the process of putting together and developing the website? So in this section, I'll lead you through some of the ways I use in day-to-day -day management of projects that help define the direction that we take, especially in the early days of a project. The first key is planning. Now, I appreciate that if you're a solo operator, some of the keys here may sound like overkill, um, but hear me out, taking some time at the beginning of the process to document, document all the plans, uh, all the parts that you're planning to build will help the project and also help speed you up when you get into future projects. So let's talk about creating a backlog. A backlog is actually really straightforward. It's just a list of all the things that you want to do or that you need to do in order to be able to deliver this project. It may be that a lot of the bigger tasks are broken down into smaller chunks that you can work on bit by bit. And for us, in most of the projects that we work on, they're fairly large scale, long running projects. The one that I'm on at the moment, or one of the ones that I'm on at the moment, has been going since October of last year. And we've launched phase one, but phase two is not gonna launch until February of next year. 
So these are long running projects that obviously have huge amounts of features that we're building and a really, really, really long backlog of, of, of work that we're going to do. The backlog list isn't static. It changes and it grows as the project does. So we may start with all of the big chunks and all of the features identified about what we're going to do. We may not have sat down and figured out all of the tasks that the developers are going to have to do to build it. Um, but the elements of a site may be something small, like a, just a series of pages for a business card site. They may be an e-commerce site. They may be a whole bunch of um, custom content that you need to build to deliver. All in all, the backlog is a living document. And just as the project flexes, the backlog flexes with the needs of the client. And how we prioritise that is where we first um, add some of that value. And this is where actually add value first came from. Is anybody familiar with agile project management? I realise there's probably not a great many of us that are project managers here. Um, I, well, the framework around project management that we use is called Scrum. One of the tenets of Scrum has been really transparent and open with our clients is where a lot of this communication type stuff that I've already talked about has come from. Um, but one of the things in Scrum is having this backlog and having the priority around it and how we choose the parts that we work on first will often be a case of looking at them and seeing which is going to add the most value to the client first. So it could be that the project that you're working on for a client, you may be adding content to it bit by bit. You might have done all the planning, you could figure out all of the things that you're going to do. And for most of us, I think with small businesses, you'll just sit down and you'll build the thing and then you'll deliver it all completed at the end and the client will get to see it at the end. And you can host it and people will be able to, to visit the website. So one of my challenges is, if you want to differentiate yourself from somebody who's doing things like that, what if you are having an ongoing conversation with the client as you're building? And I'm quite happy for you to kind of counter me <laughs> on this when we're doing Q&A, but what if you were looking at this list of things that you were bidding for the client, and one of the things that they want to do is e-commerce. What if, in order to actually get some really early value, the first thing you do is throw up a landing page and uh, optimise it for SEO, put in a contact form so that you can start gathering their emails, and you're actually starting to deliver for the client before they even see the website. But you're giving them an opportunity to start building their network. You're giving them a place to send people to say, hey, we've got a website coming soon. We're going to have three different products. Here's a little bit about what we're going to do. And getting people involved, getting the client involved first and giving them something that's actually going to add value to their business before you've even started building the site is a huge win in terms of your relationship. And it starts to set you up as this expert in your field and it gives the, starts to create this differential between you and somebody else who may be quite capable of offering the same thing. Maybe, in actual fact, this is a brand new e-commerce business that they're starting to think about, but they're not 100% sure of yet. I'm, I'm going to say this out loud, and I'll probably get booed from the audience, because I'm actually going to say the word Shopify and say, what if adding value to their business is setting up a really quick short, a store on Shopify that's got three products that gives them an opportunity to start getting some money in before you actually dive into the huge expense and challenge of building a WooCommerce store. You can probably set up a WooCommerce store that quickly too, but um, in a lot of cases, that may well be a way that you can add value. It's partnering with the client, it's conversing with them, it's actually seeing what's going to help them really early on rather than just assuming because they've come to you and said we want a website that that's exactly what they need. So we have our backlog, we have our list of things to do, we're scouring the list and making sure that the things that we pick out to do first are actually going to help the client. The other, one of the other practical applications of large-scale project management is to build iterative, I knew I was gonna trip over this one, iteratively. So instead of this whole business of starting, finishing, handing it off, it's conversing with the client throughout the whole process hey, we've built this part, we've got the about page up, we've got the contact page up, the first part that you could actually build to even publicise may just be a phone number and a Google map so that people can actually come into their bricks and mortar store. It may not always be this case of starting and finishing and then handing off. Again, we can add value to the client by keeping in, in constant communication around what they're doing. 
So if you're working through a good backlog, prioritizing the features with the client as you go, you should be able to demonstrate each feature as it's built. It can be really encouraging for a client to see the progress as it happens and not just right at the end. Um, and help them to be able to judge how this product, is, how this website is actually going to serve them. And you may even find as you build this, and if you're keeping in contact, if you're building iteratively and building it feature by feature, it may even happen that you'll get to a point where the client goes, actually, we can stop there. We're getting our massive amount of return on just this part. So this other feature that they may have requested they may not need. And having that kind of flexibility and being able to work in that kind of flexible way can be really, really valuable. Now, I understand that that can be a challenge, particularly if you're a freelancer and you're looking at a particular paycheck at the end of the month. But I think the benefit in a lot of these cases actually turns around into a, lo a longer ongoing partnership um, than just one paycheck. But again, happy to be argued with in the, in the, in the Q&A if you want. So again, this is very high level. I'm really happy to dive in deeper if you have any questions. But the other area that we can really add value is actually in our community. And um, this is a part of WordPress that's really close to my heart. I've been deeply involved in the WordPress community pretty much since I started. But I'm curious if this is, um, I'm curious, how many of you, this is your first contact with the WordPress community in general or in Singapore? So you'd, great. Now I want to ask all of you how you found out about WordCamp, but um, I don't have time. So, so if this is not your first contact with the WordPress community, how many of you attend a, a WordPress meetup, either in Singapore or wherever you're from? How many of you people didn't know that there was a WordPress meetup once a month here in Singapore? Now that you know, how many of you are going to go? <laughs> So is there anybody here that organises a meetup? I know Jamie does. I do. So here's another question. How many of you have come across the WordPress Slack? How many of you don't know what a Slack is? Does anybody not know about Slack? <laughs> okay, Slack is a messaging tool. If you've been around for a while, you might remember things like IRC. Um, or that shows how old I am, I'm really sorry. <laughs> You're all too young. Um, Slack is a messaging tool. It's a place where it's like forums, essentially, but it's in its own app. And I'll show you how to get connected to the Singapore Slack. There's also a WordPress international Slack where you can log in, set up your user, and you can have ongoing repeated conversations uh, with other people about WordPress or about business or about development or about anything. Um, so anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll show you the slide for that in a sec. So if you don't mind me in indulging me for just a second, I want to tell you a little bit of a story. Um, my first contact with WordPress community was at a WordCamp like this in Melbourne in 2011. And I, I found it because I stumbled across an ad. This was long before things like meetups showed up inside the dashboard of your WordPress site. Um, I googled WordPress conferences for some reason and found that one was happening very soon. Um, and so I traveled to it. And all of a sudden, I had this understanding of all of these people that were doing the same kind of thing, that could talk my language, um, that understood what I was talking about when I said I was building a site or I was doing this. Because I can't tell my family about this stuff. They have no idea. <laughs> so at that point, I decided to kind of dive right in. And so I went back. To, I was living in Sydney. I went back from Melbourne to Sydney and started helping out organise the WordPress meetup. I went from organising that meetup to splitting that into a second meetup. So now we have two meetups in Sydney. In fact, there's three now, where people get together and learn and discuss and talk and share ideas about using WordPress and building with WordPress. I went on to organise a WordPress meetup, a WordPress WordCamp like this. I did two in a row. The last one was five years ago. This is how hard it is. <laughs> My business really suffered because I did two word camps back to back. That was a terrible idea. But the word camps were great. Anyway, the long story short is a huge amount of my business and the connections that I've made and the fact that I'm doing what I'm doing now for a company like the company I work for is hands down because I've got involved and served and worked in the WordPress community. What does that look like? Well, first of all, 
it's show up, it's go to a meetup, it's connect with people, participate in the meetup, talk, ask questions, offer your meetup organizers ideas for talks, offer to do a talk, meet people there, connect with them and start connecting and talking to them. You can add enormous amount of value to the WordPress community just by showing up. Uh, it doesn't have to be fancy. If there is no WordPress meetup in your community, start one or get onto Slack and start meeting other people in your area. Maybe you're interested in blogging with WordPress. Maybe a niche kind of meetup would be really valuable for people in your little corner of WordPress. It doesn't have to be all about development. It doesn't have to be all about SEO. It could be just a case of how do I best use WordPress um, to manage my blog or I'm a blogger, I want to connect with other bloggers. We have just started or restarted the women's meetup in, at WordPress Melbourne, and we get together for two and a half hours on a Thursday, once every two months, for lunch. It's a WordPress meetup. I don't have to organise a talk, I don't have to do anything else. I don't have to pay for it. Actually, I do have to pay for it. I pay for my lunch, I don't have to pay for everybody, so I don't have to find sponsors. So. But it's a meetup, and so there's so much scope for so many different kinds of meetups, and you can add value to the community by doing something like that. And in actual fact, when you start doing that, people start recognising you as a leader, even if you don't feel like a leader. Um, they start recognising you as an expert, even if you don't feel like an expert. Somebody was telling me this morning about faking it till you make it, and I am living proof <laughs> that um, don't, tell, don't tell my clients sitting <laughs> But I fake it till I make it every day at work. <laughs> and it seems to be that we're making it. So, so um, once you've got to that point where you're understanding your, your value in the WordPress community and you're participating and, and getting involved, maybe you can step up and start adding more value by actually contributing. Maybe it's doing a WordPress talk about how you discovered WordPress. Maybe you represent a company that could, ha could help support a meetup by providing a venue. Maybe you want to sponsor by paying for the pizza for a, a, you know, a month and get a little bit of recognition for your support by doing that. Um, we have on, you know, there's so many different ways that people can get involved. Everyone tends, tends to assume that Contributing is just a case of creating a talk. There's so many more ways to actually add value to the WordPress community and to your local community than just doing talks. Maybe you could keep the meetup page up to date. Maybe you're really great at content writing and you could write blogs that are going to help promote your group. Um, there are so many different ways to communicate what you're doing and to help participate in that. And um, so I, I thoroughly recommend Make it, if you are available to make some time to help build your community, uh, talk to your WordPress meetup organiser and see what you can do, see what they need. Um, serve and uh, you may find that you get served as well. Finally, uh, if you're the kind of person for whom leadership comes naturally or actually even if it doesn't, there's scope for anyone to get involved in leading meetups and other parts of the WordPress project. Um, particularly if you come to it with an attitude of service. Talk to the leaders of your community and offer your help. Maybe you can become a leader and help spread the load of organising a meetup. Maybe you can organise a specialist group within your the meetup, like our WordPress for Women. Maybe you could do a meetup, you could do a workshop and do a, an occasional one off workshop. Maybe you could do a kids' workshop if you're interested in helping encourage younger people to get involved in WordPress. There's so much scope. There's genuinely no limit to what you can do. Um, and what we can do if we have enough enthusiastic participants. I'm pretty confident that if uh, the guys decide or the, the team wants to organise another WordCamp next year, they'll be looking for more help. And if you're interested in events and doing that kind of stuff, there's definitely scope for helping there as well. Just don't say that to them perhaps today. They might not be ready to do it again. And, you know, give them a few weeks to get over it. So... Having talked about ways that you can help the WordPress community, here's where to find them for those of you for whom that this is new information. First, you can go to meetup.com and look for WordPress meetups. And most of the time, I think it, you can specify the area that you're looking. So if you're in Singapore, you can um, find your meetup there and they will tell you details of when they're connecting and getting together. If you don't have a meetup group where you are, 
Um, one of the ways to get involved, um, or one of the ways to actually start looking at how to set one up is to go to make.wordpress.org. There's a whole organisation there dedicated to actually supporting people organising meetups. So if you want to create a meetup somewhere that, where there doesn't already exist one, um, that wasn't the right English, and I can't remember what I did anyway, um, go to make.wordpress.org, set yourself, apply f to set your meetup up, and WordPress Foundation actually pay for the meetup fees. So you can set up a meetup without actually having to pay the quarterly fees for that, which is really helpful. And there's a huge number of people, Mayo, me, John, who are in the forums and, and chatting all the time and helping people uh, support new WordPress meetups and even WordCamps. Um, and Slack. So I mentioned Slack before, this messaging tool. It's actually an, it's, it's an app that you can install on your phone and on your laptop. You create a user. And you can have, I should have t taken photos of it, but you can have conversations with other people, both in Singapore or wherever you live and around the world. Um, and this is where you find out about it, make.wordpress.org forward slash chat that tells you about Slack and how to get connected to the wider WordPress Foundation Slack. Um, there's the Singapore Slack. Um, and then there's a list there in that other link, and I'll make these available online um, so that you can find other local Slacks. In conclusion, my adding value in the WordPress community has paid big dividends for my career and adding value to my clients has done the same. So while you may have heard me say through the, all these previous sections that I'm all about serving, that you need to serve your clients, um, absolutely believe that if you serve, you yourself will also be served. However, while meeting the meets needs of others, even as you find that your needs are met too, it's important for us to have an attitude that the benefits are a byproduct of our service rather than the reason for our service. People can spot someone who's been self-serving. And so if we serve selflessly, um, we win more people to ourselves than if we are obviously doing what we're doing for our own benefit. Don't be that person. Thanks. I haven't checked. Do we have time for questions? We have five minutes. Five minutes. It should just be enough. Awesome. I love that. It means I, oh no, there is a question. I'm like, great, I answered all the questions before they even asked. Uh, Heidi. Hi. Um, with regard to giving regular updates about progress to the client, mm -hmm. um, have you encountered a uh, something where the client requests for revisions to the un unfinished product up to a point where it detracts from the core progress of the building itself. And how do you manage that? So the question is how do you manage where if you're showing the client as you go, the client actually wanting to revise while you're on the go? Yes, I have. Uh, for the most part, it's, a, it's all about the communication. Um, I, unless I can see that the revision that they're asking for is very specifically needed, then I will perhaps do it. Uh, because we're running and because of the scale of the projects that we're doing, we use Scrum and what that generally means is that we will set the work that we're doing for a sprint and that is the work that we'll do in that sprint. So we have very clear boundaries before we even have that conversation so we can say to them, you do appreciate that what you want here is out of scope. We are finishing the sprint at this point. We can introduce more work there. Let's talk about that then. So it, it, in a, a lot of cases, it's boundary setting. I've been able to, say, and we have, or because of this way that we structure the project, we have those boundaries built in. That's the ideal. It's very difficult to do that when you're on your own. And you have a, and so it is a thin line, but it is a very much for me, generally, a case of being able to set that boundary and say, yes, I can do this. This is what the impact is going to be. Do you want me to proceed understanding that that's what the impact is going to be is usually a really good way of introducing that conversation. I do appreciate that it's a little bit of a tricky, it's tricky because I'm suggesting all of these things and it actually introduces a fair amount of complexity. Particularly, it's a lot easier to take the client's money go build the thing and then talk to them at the end. The problem that you have there is that they go, they don't have that opportunity for that communication. So it's a fine balance between 
finding yourself under pressure, but also being able to push back. So you have to be strong enough internally to be able to push back if you need to, I think is probably the most expedient answer. I, think there's I have a question regarding a uh, client. Um, sometimes the client, if the client don't know what they want, how, how to like, uh, communicate with them? Oh, you see, this is where it starts to get into a sales conversation, and I'm not a salesperson. Um, so, so pretty much my go-to question around that is what is the problem that you're trying to solve? So the client may come to you and say, I want you to build me this thing here. This is what the thing needs to look like. However, if you have an understanding of what the problem that they're trying to solve is, it may actually be that the way to build, to solve that problem is different than what they're telling you that they want. So if you understand the problem and can build according to the problem and solve the problem, you're winning them without actually doing exactly necessarily what it is that they say that they want. So if you're in, so that's my first thing is understand the problem. So it may be that a lot of conversation and stuff has to happen to get to that point. So understand the problem and, and give them a solution to the problem without necessarily helping. So that's how you help them get to that point of knowing what they want, really. Because um, it's actually, at the end of the day, it's not even necessarily about design. It, you know, that becomes part of it. But at the end of the day, they have n clients have needs, their customers have needs. If we have an understanding of what their customers need and the problems that the client is trying to solve, we can help. We can help them solve their problems and that will help uncover what it is that they need. I don't know if that helped. Did that help? Yeah, thanks. And then the other question is sometimes when uh, you join some community, when the, peop the, the number of people, when the people size is small, then usually the, like, the conversation quality is really good, you enjoy it, but when the the number of people increase over a certain amount of month, uh, people, then it seems like the the conversation is not like uh, that uh, focused. So how how to like make the balance and um, at the same time when you engage more people and you also ensure the quality is not compromised. That's a difficult thing because we've certainly seen this happen and uh, as communities grow, you get the same questions over and over and over again and you're like, I answered this question last week and now somebody new's come along and they're asking the same question again. Um, I don't necessarily have an answer other than to try and recreate smaller groups within the bigger group. So you actually start finding the niches that you're more interested in and, and certainly um, in something like Slack, where you've got a whole lot of different rooms you can get involved in, finding the smaller groups is actually helpful rather than being in the big room where everybody's talking and, and rehashing the same thing over and over again. And particularly with meetups, uh, what, we, what we're seeing happen is that we're getting a whole bunch of, since WordPress started showing people's meetups in the dashboard, we're getting more and more people coming through, which is great, but we're getting the same kind of questions over and over again. And so planning groups or events around catering the needs of those start, what we're having to do is start reintroducing this idea of more groups that target particular niches or particular areas. Here's a user group. We're all going to talk about how to build a WordPress site from the ground up, how to build a local machine for beginning developers. So you actually have to start reintroducing this idea of smaller groups within the bigger group to help counteract that busyness and that noise, I think. Thanks. No problem, thank you. Okay, thank you. Let's give a big hand to Detail. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay, if you have further questions, you can look for her during tea break. You can find or me. Or the after party. So right now we're going to move